I'm Cheryl and I'm a nutritionist. I'm based up in Orewa. Now I've been working up here on the Hibiscus Coast, gosh, for 11 years now and I specialize in weight loss. So weight loss is my absolute passion based on my own journey of losing, I lost 30 kilos about 23 years ago and I've kept it off ever since. And in my journey of learning how to keep weight off myself, I became absolutely super passionate about nutrition. I decided to change my career and become a nutritionist when I was in my early 30s. And it's been absolutely a wonderful decision. And I, I absolutely love working with people. And as I've specialized in weight loss and food addiction, which is my other favorite topic, sugar addiction, this topic of IBS has always been something that I've just sort of done behind the scenes because I suffer from IBS. And that's been a big part, I guess, in my own health journey of learning how to manage my IBS symptoms and factor it into my low carb plan. You know, and it's something that I've worked with quite a lot of clients on as well, which is what inspired me, I suppose, to do this webinar. Because IBS is something like everything, I suppose, in nutrition. It is very unique. You know, there are no one size fits all solutions. But one thing that I've learned from these years of working with people one on one is that actually a lot of the tips and I've, that I've been able to give clients has really helped them to overcome a vast majority of their symptoms and to be able to do so while they're still following their food plan and losing weight. So to me, it's, you know, it's really has been the best of both outcomes, really, because they've been able to deal with their gut and improve their situation, while at the same time being able to stick to the plan and lose weight. So to me, you know, that's the absolute best of both worlds. And that's really what I want to share with you tonight. My nutritionist, I remember back in the day when I decided that I wanted to become a nutritionist, my nutritionist, who I'd been seeing for several years, said to me, well, Cheryl, you know, we teach what we need to learn. And I do really swear by that because goodness knows that I'm learning every single day from working with my clients. And this is particularly true from IBS. IBS is a very individual thing, but there are definitely some many common actions which I've suggested to clients which have really helped. And you know, the learning never ends. But that's what I want to share with you tonight, just everything that I've learned in the hope that it's going to help you as well. Now, just a bit of housekeeping, just before we get started, um, your microphone should be muted. That's what I normally do in these things. So um, yeah, if you, if you want to ask a question, you can either write it in the chat box. Oops. You can either write it in the chat box, okay, and then I'm going to answer them at the end, and I'm sure I'll have time to do that. Otherwise, just write them down, and at the end of the presentation, there will be time if you want to um, ask me at the end or talk about your specific situation. Maybe you might have some questions about weight loss. Look, anything that you'd like to ask me, we will definitely have time at the end. So either write them in the chat box or we'll talk about it at the end. And of course, if you don't want to be seen when I exit from this presentation, please just make sure your camera's turned off. Um, I'm I do record this presentation. I make it available to the people who have registered but weren't able to attend. But I'm thinking what I will do this time is I'm not going to, um, when I do the recording, I'm not going to include the questions at the end. So if you want to come on camera and you're in your PJs, <laughs> don't worry, I'll cut that end part off. So that question time is just going to be for those of you who are live. So if you're in your PJs, you're safe. Don't panic. We're not going to turn off the camera and, and see you in your PJs. Or maybe that's just me. <laughs> okay, so here's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Now, I'm not going to make this an in-depth conversation about what causes IBS. I am going to talk about that a little bit. But I figure those of you who are here probably have done, you, you've got your own experience with IBS, right? So what I really want to focus on is the three key areas that you can work on alongside your low carb food plan to really help with symptoms and hopefully help you manage your IBS while you're losing weight. So of course, we're going to talk about food, right? How you can integrate your low carb plan with good principles of IBS management. I really want to share with you the mindset tools that I use and have helped clients to just really balance out a bit of that whole body brain connection. 
And then I'd love to share some key pointers on gut health, some things that you can bring in, because it's not just about what you eat, it's how you eat that really plays a big impact on your digestion. So I just want to share with you some top tips that I've used with clients that have really helped them sort out their gut and improve their symptoms of IBS. Now, of course, I want to share with you, first of all, my experience, because there's nothing more poignant, is there, than what we've been through ourselves. And what I went through in my own IBS journey was really transformative, and it completely changed the way that I viewed, I view, actually, IBS and how I've worked with clients. So I just want to share a little bit about that before I continue on, just so you can sort of know where I'm coming from. Because the way I used to work with people with IBS changed 100%. I did an absolute 180 degree turnaround, to be honest, based on what I went through with my IBS. And it happened about five years ago. So for me, with my IBS, it's very much manifested in just irregularity, constipation. I've never really been regular. And I do suffer from bloating, you know, gas. And it's, it's one of those things that I've probably had I mean, my journey is about weight loss. When I was overweight in my, I was overweight up until my early 20s when I first started changing my lifestyle and started on my journey of losing 30 kilos. And I guess when I was on that journey of weight loss, I became a lot more interested in my own health. So I often think, man, did I have IBS back when I was fat? And actually, I, I can't really remember, but I wasn't aware of a lot of things because I was probably too busy eating and partying at that time. <laughs> But certainly I was very aware that as I started becoming more interested in my own health, looking at my body, as I lost the weight, I became quite aware of the fact that I was never regular, that I would have these bouts of bloating and gas and just, just that my digestion wasn't great. It was just always this underlying thing. And of course, as the internet became more widely used, because you know I'm in my 40s, so we, we didn't have the internet back in those days, which is quite hard to remember. As I started doing more reading, then I became aware that probably I did have this thing called IBS. And so I've done a lot of my own research. But so definitely that's my symptoms. Now, sometimes I know some people who suffer IBS also can have a really bad diarrhea. That hasn't been my journey, although, you know, it can happen from time to time. But for me, it's very much about the bloating, you know, sore stomach, eating things and that's sort of been my journey to date, on and off. And then about five years ago, it got really bad um, to the point where, gosh, I was seeing practitioners. I went and did food allergy testing. I spent thousands of dollars, to be honest, trying to work out what is my problem? You know, what, because of course, with me being a nutritionist at this point, I kind of wanted it to be about the food. For me, it had to be about the food. It must be what I'm eating. You know, and I wanted it to be about the food because in my mind, well, if, if I'm allergic to something, then it's going to be easy. I'll just stop eating that thing and then I'll be fixed. So I really wanted to make it about the food. I went to the doctor. He referred me to an IBS specialist. And, you know, I looked at the FODMAP diet and I was sort of, you know, I'd sort of put it into play a little bit, but not with a lot of passion. Then I thought, right, I'll go get tested for SIBO. Um, which is when you've got the bacteria in your small intestine, because I thought, well, if I do the SIBO test, that will fix me, then I'll have a diagnosis, then I'll know what to do. So I trotted along um, to the House of Health, and I got my SIBO test, and yes, it came back positive. So, okay, then I knew I had SIBO, but then what? They weren't actually able to be, to really help me in any sort of plan moving forward, so, you know, this is what it's like a little bit. And if you know, if you've done testing and experimenting and maybe you've seen practitioners with IBS, this is the problem. It's very hard to get a firm answer because there is no cure. So it really is about, I suppose, individual experience. So I did all this testing, got my SIBO diagnosis, but nothing was really, really improving it. And then I went to see an acupuncturist. I thought, right, I'll get some acupuncture. That'll fix me. And the practitioner I was talking to when I was telling her what I was going through, she said, well, Cheryl, it sounds to me like, you know, so it's basically everything you eat. And I was like, yes, it's I, at that point, it was a lot of pain every single day. There was just no relief. And she said to me, well, my thought is that it's got nothing to do with food. It's all about your head. And to be honest, I was quite shocked and actually quite peed off with her, to be honest, when she said that, because, of course, I was like, well, 
you know, how ridiculous. I don't, you know, that I just didn't, I refused to believe that that could be the truth. I thought, no, it's got to be about food. Come on. It's not about, it's not about me. How can it be about my mind? Like I was quite resistant to her suggestion, but anyway, um, about a, a week after that, I was going on holiday and that's why you see this lovely Brazil flag on this picture here. So I was going on holiday and it was a long holiday. My husband's from Brazil and we ended up going for about a month and it was so interesting. So after being in all this pain every single day with no relief for probably going on months at this point, it was, I was really, it was very difficult. Anyway, I went on holiday. We arrived in Brazil and after a couple of days, I sort of thought, oh gosh, you know, my stomach feels better. You know, once the jet lag had um, improved, I thought, gosh, my stomach feels really good. And then I noticed I was eating all these foods that had been a real no-no, the foods that I'll talk to you about shortly. Um, you know, the foods that are supposed to be really bad for IBS. I was eating all of them. And do you know, my stomach was fine. And when I realized this, I was absolutely in shock. Um, and I just heard the words of this practitioner echoing in my head where she said, Cheryl, it's not about food. It's about you. And do you know, I was there for a month and I did not have one episode of stomach upset. I was regular. I couldn't believe it. And I was eating all the foods. You know what it's like when you're on holiday and you're staying at people's houses. I wasn't even sticking so strictly to low carb. Um, I mean, I was for the most part, because that's just how I eat. That's how I've managed to keep the weight off. But you know, that's how I eat. But I was absolutely shocked that my IBS that had been so bad, I just didn't even have one flare up. And it really knocked me for six. And I just heard the words of this practitioner echoing in my head. And it really, if I hadn't have experienced that myself, I don't think I would have believed it. And it was because, you know, being in holiday, especially a holiday where it, nothing was up to me, it was up to my husband because it, it's his home country. So I could just kind of sit there and when it was, when the kids were saying, oh, what are we going to do today, mum? You know, I was so relaxed. And I said, well, I don't know, ask dad. It's got nothing to do with me. This is his country, um, you know. So it was really relaxing. And I think this is the key. Um, when you live a busy, rushing life, and this is this whole mind-body connection that I would never have believed if I hadn't that experienced myself. And when I had that opportunity to completely relax for a period of time, which does not happen very often, it had an amazing effect on me. So when I experienced that for myself, it has really changed how I work with clients and even myself. And what it's basically led me to do is, yes, still work on the food. And I do apply the principles of the low FODMAP diet. But more importantly, really, really try working on mindset and some breathing exercises. And I'm going to share those with you tonight, because I truly think that that is the solution to getting much better management of your IBS. It's not just about the food, it's bringing in all of these things, food, mindset techniques, and improving your gut health so that you do make progress. So sorry, that was a bit of a spiel there, but I just wanted you to know a little bit more about my story. Of course, we're all individual, but that's why I'm so big on mindset because I've had my own experience of just what a difference it made. And I know that we don't always have the opportunity, especially right now, to trot off on holiday for a month to a foreign land. Wouldn't that be nice? But if we can incorporate some of these principles of mindset into our daily life, then I think it's really beneficial. Okay, so enough about me. Let's look at the topic at hand. So I'm just going to quickly go over Again, I don't want to talk about this too much, but just a rough overview for some of you who might be newer to this um, about some of the main things that can cause IBS. And then we're going to start looking at what to do about it. So as I've mentioned, SIBO, which is small intestine bacterial overgrowth, that is quite a common cause of irritable bowel syndrome. And that's where the, you know, the, the cause of that dysfunction has, has started in your small intestine. And that has a lot to do with how you're eating. So as I said, I did a test for that. You go and do a breath test and it was quite horrible and mine came back positive. So I know that that's a big part of what has caused my IBS. Like I said, it still doesn't give you a firm answer, but it is definitely a trigger of IBS. Now, of course, diet plays a big part in 
irritable bowel, right? Especially if you might be eating things you're allergic to, you might be intolerant to them. Then what you eat, certain foods ferment more easily than others. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. But certainly how you eat too. And I'm going to share with you some tips on how you can improve your eating to help manage these symptoms. Now, illness can be a cause of it as well. You may have a really bad, I've had a couple of clients actually who are absolutely fine and then they had a terrible bout of gastro and were left with these ongoing um, symptoms like IBS that have gone on for years and it was really caused through that stress of being ill. Of course, parasites can cause a lot of dysfunction in your gut. Diverticulitis, you know, the gut and the digestive system is very complex and very unique you know we are all unique here so it is complicated which is why I'm not a doctor and I'm certainly not a doctor specializing in IBS I just really want to share with you the more the food side of it the part that I know but I know that illness can be a cause of it as I've already highlighted stress is really important what's going on in your head and then of course your gut health so your digestion how strong it is how quickly things can move through your gut and a big part about that is digestion and your stomach acid. So I want to give you some tips tonight on how to help with that. But let's start at, our, at your favorite place and mine, food. Now, you're probably aware of the low FODMAP food plan. And that is really looking at foods that easily ferment in our gut. Okay, so it's this fermentation of food that is going to cause all of this gas to build up and make us feel bloated. And what I want to do now, I'm not going to do a whole overview of the low FODMAP plan because you're probably aware of that. But what I want to help you with is just to highlight how it applies to a low carb eating plan. Now, as an overview, these are some of the big baddies that are going to cause fermentation and could be a cause of your fermentation when you follow low FODMAP. And then we're going to talk about the ones that are a bit problematic when you're doing low carb. Now, of course, bread and gluten, that's definitely one of the big baddies. But of course, the good news is that when we do low carb, we don't eat bread anyway. So that is already getting rid of one of the big baddies. But bread is probably, and gluten, one of the top causes of fermentation in the gut and IBS. And probably number two alongside that is dairy. So dairy definitely can be a bit of an issue with low carb because of course high fat dairy is a really good source of fat. So we're going to talk about how to manage that. Um, now your sugar-free products, I'll talk more about that in a bit, but they can definitely be an issue when you're doing low carb, particularly if you're like me and you've got a bit of a sugar addiction and you've, you've overcome your sugar ad addiction by eating some of the low carb alternatives. Well, certainly some are better than others. So I'll talk about that. Now the big food group that unfortunately causes problems and it is a problem when you're doing low carb is vegetables. And this is challenging. And when I've worked with clients, this is what really has got the best relief, which is just identifying the vegetables that are a problem. Because of course, as you'll know, if you follow low carb, um, we eat a lot of vegetables and vegetables are great because that's what we can fill our plate up with, okay? Because we're not eating rice, we're not eating bread, we're, we're cut back on grains, which is great. But unfortunately, if you're eating a lot of vegetables and you have IBS, you may find that you are feeling bloated. So I'm going to talk about that now in terms of how to manage that. The other group, which is very high in fermentable carbohydrate matter, which can cause a problem, is fruit. Now, luckily, again, with a low-carb food plan, if you're following it properly, you're not going to be eating a lot of fruit anyway. So that's really helpful, too. I think in low carb, the three main areas that could be causing you problems are your veggies, dairy, and some of these artificially sweetened products. With fruit, the worst fruit is actually apples, but I mean, my clients wouldn't eat a lot of apples anyway because they're high in carbs. So that really helps with that. 
Okay, so those of you who have worked with me before will be very aware of this list. So this is the My Foundation Food list for just general low carb eating, right? So this isn't about IBS, but just to highlight. So the things that are under the green column are mostly protein. Then we've got our veggies, then we've got our fat. So the green means, yes, this is great for low carb eating and the orange and red are the things that we need to be aware of. Now, as I've just said, a lot of things in this column are things that are going to be triggering for IBS, but luckily a lot of my clients don't really eat them. So that helps big time in terms of limiting what could be fermenting for IBS. Same with fruit. You know, on my food plans, mostly my clients are having berries, which aren't too troublesome when it comes to IBS. So fruit, again, is eliminated anyway because a lot of uh, fruits aren't eaten. In terms of protein, well, meat is actually a great thing to eat because it's not highly fermentable. So if you're getting good protein, that's really beneficial and that shouldn't be an issue on your low-carb food plan managing IBS. Eggs can be a little bit problematic and so can protein powder. Although in saying that, I've only had probably two clients that I ever recall over the last 11 years who were finding protein powder was a challenge. And you can always use a non-dairy protein as well. So again, just highlighting your problem area is this one, your vegetables and also some of the fats, your high fat dairy and some nuts. And I'll talk about that now. Luckily, a lot of your other fats except avocado are actually quite low in FODMAP. So a lot of these fats, you can have these with your low carb plan and you're going to be fine. Now, I actually have a foundation food list similar to this where I've gone through and, and changed it. So I've taken out the things that are high in, in fermentable carbohydrate that can be problematic on IBS. So look, if you are one of my clients or you're part of my weight loss academy, I can give you access to that. So that's that's just, um, just takes that little guesswork out because it's eliminated some of those foods already. Okay, so as I've highlighted, this is what I just want to quickly go over now. These are your big baddies. So these are the foods that you definitely want to cut back on big time if you're struggling with bloating. Onion and garlic would probably be top of the list. Um, you definitely want to limit those. They're quite problem problematic for IBS. And unfortunately, the other two that are it's such a shame because they're so useful in low carb is cauliflower and avocado. Now, I've had a few clients who unfortunately were, you know, using the cauliflower alternatives because, of course, cauliflower is so useful, isn't it? You can make cauliflower rice and cauliflower mash. Now, that's all very well. But if you're finding that you're bloated a couple of hours after meals, you want to cut back on that. Celery is another one that's really quite high in fermentable carbohydrates. So, again, you can have a little bit of celery, but you don't want to have too much. And broccoli. Out of those, I think cauliflower is probably the highest and unfortunately the biggest offender because a lot of people use cauliflower to make some of these low carb substitutes. So if you're doing that and you're finding you're struggling, definitely cut back on that. Now milk, yes, that can be a problem too. Probably, you know, what the, the, the challenge with dairy products is lactose, that sugar that's found in dairy products. Now the good news is that you're, a lot of the cheeses, you're, higher um, higher fat cheese or like more um, aged cheese that the more aged a cheese is it actually has a lot less lactose so I found both for myself and for clients that actually we can have parmesan cheese some of those harder cheeses tasty and it's absolutely fine but certainly if you are suffering from bloating it's a good idea to eliminate the milk cottage cheese, some of those soft cheeses, which are going to have higher levels of lactose and just see if that helps you. Now, cabbage is another one that is definitely high in the FODMAP scale. So that's another good one to eliminate. In terms of nuts, nuts aren't too bad. The, the two that you definitely want to cut out if you're struggling with bloating are pistachio nuts and cashews. Now, I know that cashews are a really popular option, and of course, they're blimmin' delicious, but they definitely are one of the highest nuts in terms of fermentable carbohydrate, and they could be problematic. So again, 
if you're finding you're getting bloated, cut back on those and go for the other type of nuts, your almonds. And just basically most other nuts are okay. It's really these two that are your worst offenders. Okay, so this other big group is definitely problematic for people who are doing low carb. And look, it's wonderful to have some of the products that are now available, some of these processed foods, but unfortunately, these sugar alcohols that have been added can be really problematic to your gut. So products like the Atkins bars, which are of course very, very popular. And look, I encourage my clients to, especially if they're eating sugar in the beginning when they come to see me, I usually do recommend that, hey, bring in some of these sugar-free alternatives, particularly in the beginning when you're making changes and breaking habits. It's absolutely brilliant that we can have some of these low-carb alternatives, unless you have IBS. And again, it's a very individual thing. But these sugar alcohols, how they work is that your gut doesn't really recognize them. So the, the effect of that is that in theory, it's not going to impact your insulin. So that's what you want for weight loss, right? You don't want your insulin to be stimulated because, of course, that's going to lead to fat storage. So, you know, the food manufacturers very cleverly have said, well, look, we're going to, we'll put these, we'll put these sugar alcohols in the products and therefore they'll be low carb, yay. But unfortunately, a lot of them can cause your IBS to be triggered and cause gut dysfunction. So the, some of the main products that I see clients eating that are causing them problem are the Atkins bars. They've still got maltitol. And it's interesting because some products now are actually reformulating to take the maltitol out, both because of IBS and also because there is talk out there that maltitol does actually stimulate insulin. So that's interesting. I certainly, if I've got clients who are eating a lot of these artificially sweetened products, even if it's not about IBS, but more about weight loss, if they're not losing weight as fast as they want, I normally encourage them to cut back on these products, which usually does help. So yeah, the other one is the sugar-free ice cream. That's got maltitol and sorbitol. So you've got to be aware of that. Now those double D marshmallows, I'm sure there's many a uh, client who has succumbed to the double D and have ended up with the big double diarrhea. Um, yeah, that's, that's happened more times than not and <laughs> with my clients who are having them. So yes, they, they have a couple of, I think they've got isomalt in them and a few other of these artificial sweeteners. So look, if you have just one or two, you're probably going to be fine. But how many people only have one or two? I don't have to explain to you how easy it can be to eat a few more and that's where you can get into trouble. So I've had a lot of success with clients, you know, cutting back on the, some of these foods and just getting them to be really more careful looking at labels and by cutting back on some of these low carb products, it's definitely helped with the IBS symptoms. Now, in terms of your sugar-free products, um, you know, stevia, of course, is another artificial sweetener that's really widely used, as is erythritol. Now, in theory, these are supposed to be better for your gut. Um, it's a theory that, of course, I talk about a lot with clients. I know for me, I cannot have the other sugar alcohols that were on the other page, but I find that I am fine with stevia and I'm fine with erythritol as well. And I've had quite a few other clients who, with IBS who are similar. So again, this is something that I guess you, we all need to experiment with, but hopefully if you can tolerate these options, it does give you a bit more variety in terms of what you can choose. Um, my fav, one of my favorite sugar-free chocolates, which is the Well Naturally Sugar-Free Chocolate, which is available in all the supermarkets, that uses stevia. And I found that that's absolutely fine. So yay, it's always good to be able to have some options. So just experiment, just start observing if you're finding you're eating some of these products and it, you know, it's triggering bloating and it's just not working for you, then I really encourage you to keep a food diary and just track and you'll soon start to see patterns of what could be causing it. And the key trigger with bloating is that especially with IBS, it tends to be worse later in the day. You know, you might eat something and you might feel okay, but that fermentation just starts building up and building up. You might have dinner 
and then straight away you feel bloated, but it's unlikely to be what you've just eaten. It's more likely to be what you had for lunch or possibly what you had as a snack that's been bubbling away and fermenting for a few hours. And then you eat your dinner and boom, game on. So with your bloating, look back a couple of hours, maybe earlier in the day to start to identify the foods that are not working for your gut. So that's just given you a bit of an overview of some of the foods that are most problematic and low carb that are going to be likely to cause a problem for you if you've got IBS. But as I said, and certainly with my own experience, this is the challenge. Food is only one part of it. And as I said, I've experienced this so poignantly myself. Really, I think a big part of the problem is that we're all blimmin' stressing out. You know what it's like when you're stressed, your gut's all churned up. How is that going to impact digestion? Well, it, it has a massive impact. So what I found has been helpful, and you ladies who are part of my academy are going to yawn and think, oh God, here she goes again. But look, these are just two simple things that really, really help you to get your mind in a better place and to deal with the stress so that your gut feels calmer. Now, journaling is my absolute favorite tool that I use with clients and I use myself every single morning doing that journaling for five or 10 minutes or longer just to help basically process what's going on in your head. And you do, you feel calmer afterwards. So if you're going through a really stressful time, your gut's on fire, your IBS is flared up, Yes, of course, I'm going to encourage you to pull out some of those foods that we've just talked about, but just as importantly, in fact, probably more importantly, I really encourage you to pull out that journal and get consistent with a habit of writing, because this is the goal, to help deal with your emotions, calm your farm, work with that stress a bit better so that your stomach can calm down. Now, the most powerful way to do that is with doing some deep breathing. Again, look, something that is absolutely free and it's a brilliant, brilliant tool to add into your daily routine to help you calm your brain and your gut and get these two working better together. There's a big nerve called the vagus nerve that connects your brain to your gut and it's believed that doing deep breathing is just the absolute best way to stimulate this nerve and calm it down. So deep breathing. And the great thing about deep breathing, and this is what I encourage you to do, is that yes, you can do it each morning. You don't have to do it for long. But it's another brilliant tool to just do for a couple of minutes before you eat to get your body in a really good state for optimal digestion. You know, it's free. It's not going to cost you anything to do it. And it's an absolutely brilliant habit for you to pull in and get used to doing so that you can really work on this gut brain connection. Now, what I've written underneath here, two by four, three by six, this is a really simple breathing exercise that my nutritionist actually shared with me. And this is what I do each morning. So I thought I'd share this with you because it, it is so easy um, and it does not take long. So this is my breathing practice. And what I do is you breathe in for two breaths and then you breathe out for four. And I do that three times. And then once I've done that, I increase to three and out for six. Do that three times. Actually, and then I do, got even thinking about this, I'm starting to take some deep breaths. And then I finish off with three lots of breathing in for four and breathing out for eight. Now that really is just absolutely simple. It is, you know, it's something that you can do every day. You can do that before you eat. And that is just going to instantly help calm your stress, which is going to put you in a much better state to eat and digest. Right. So the last topic we're going to cover is some suggestions on how to improve your digestion, because of course, that's a massive part of this. It's not just what we eat, but how we eat and who we are when we eat it, what's going on up in our head. So let's just look at some pointers for gut health 
so that you can have some really good tips to get started with to improve your digestion and help your stomach deal with food a bit better. So these are my top tips. I'd say out of all of these, the most, probably the pow most powerful ones is stimulating your stomach acid. So low stomach acid is a massive cause of why we're not digesting food, which is then why it's fermenting. Okay, and that's actually common, particularly as we age. And also if you are a blood type A, Unfortunately, blood type A's, of which I'm one, we are not blessed with strong stomach acid. So if you can get into the habit of stimulating your acid, that's a brilliant thing to do. How do you do that? Well, you can take a supplement, and I'm going to show you what I recommend on the next page. Otherwise, a really simple thing to do is just drink a little bit of apple cider vinegar with water before you eat. Not a lot, not a big glass of water, just a small glass, but that's a great way to actually wake up your stomach acid and get your body ready for the food. Now, don't drink a whole lot of water with meals because then you're going to flush out your good stomach acid. Every time I see people on you know, diet advice saying, look, if you're hungry, just before you eat dinner, have a massive glass of water and then you're not going to eat as much. I cringe. That's terrible advice. What you're going to do is have a massive glass of water, flush out all your acid, and then eat to a stomach that's all diluted. So don't drink a whole lot of water with meals. Drink it between meals. Now, how many times have you heard this? Eat slowly. I hate that advice because I'm not a slow eater, but I tell you what, it helps big time. So this is all about just simple things, right? Simple things we all know, but probably don't do. So eating more slowly, of course, gives your body a chance to better break down that food so it's not going to ferment in your gut and cause bloating. Now, leaving four hours between meals, that's another one that the ladies, you ladies in my academy will recognize that I really have as one of my key suggestions because that gives your body time between meals to properly digest the food. Now, snacking and eating reg too regularly is one of the key causes of SIBO, that bacterial overgrowth in your small intestine. Because your body has something called the MMC, the migrating motor complex. And it's like a little cleaner that comes out to clean your small intestine with his little broom. And he only operates when there's no food in your system. So after you've eaten, probably you might have digested that meal within two, two and a half hours. Then your cleaner is going to come out and clean it. Now, if the minute you put food in your mouth, that cleaner is going to stop his job. So then your system is not getting a chance to click to cleanse. And that is a big trigger of what can start to cause SIBO because your intestines just don't get a chance to self-regulate. And then the bacteria starts getting messy and funky. So leaving time between meals is a simple trick that's really going to help. Now, when you're having a high stress day, cut back on fiber. Don't eat all those fibrous vegetables because they're probably going to block you up and start fermenting. Cut back on caffeine. You don't necessarily have to do it all the time, but if you're really stressed out, it would be a great thing to do to help calm your gut down. And also cut back on fat. You want to maybe cut back on fat a little bit, which is of course important in low carb eating because some people do have a high amount of fat with their meals. If you're feeling stressed and your gut's sore, cut back on fat because that's just going to make digestion a little bit easier which is what you want, especially if you're having a flare up. And these are all things of what you can do to just manage your IBS, right? You may not cure it, but by bringing in these things, hopefully your IBS will be far less frequent and it won't last for as long. Now, as I've just mentioned, there are some supplements you can get to help. So these are my faves that I use and also have suggested to clients. This one here, LBS, they've rebranded. This is blimmin' brilliant, this one. If you're constipated, it's the best supplement. It was recommended to me from a client who has IBS who said it just changed her life. Um, and she doesn't, have, you don't have to take it every day, but it's, it's a really nice one that I just take. If I haven't been for a day or two, it's quite gentle, brilliant. You don't have to take it every day. Um, it's quite gentle. You can modify your intake, but that's really good for just keeping things going right? So that, so that your bowel doesn't get stagnant and constipated. This one here is a 
beta betaine. It's like this is going to help stimulate your stomach acid. So you can take this just before you eat. And that's really helpful to help you digest food. Also, of course, your digestive enzymes. So if you struggle with digestion, taking a simple digestive enzyme with your meal is a really easy thing to do. And it makes a big difference. This is just going to flood your gut with the enzymes that are required for digestion. And they're not expensive. It's just a little supplement. Um, so that's a really good thing that you can add in, particularly maybe with your main meals, so that your body can process it better, so that it's not going to ferment in your gut. Now this little gem here, which I had never heard of, I got through a website called Plant Rhythms. Now she's based in West Auckland, Plant Rhythms. It's called Cranesville Digestive. That was recommended to me by a client. And this is the only thing that I've ever found that if you've got a flare up. So all of these other ones are sort of designed to help prevent IBS or, you know, help your gut. This particular one is absolutely brilliant. If the minute you find that first sign of bloating, I get a drop of full and I put it under my tongue and it's brilliant. It has been so good in just helping, as I say, put out the fire. So that is a little gem of a thing that I got, as I said, through a company called Plant Rhythms. It's been brilliant. I haven't had to use it too often, but boy, when I do, it's fantastic. Now, of course, on the side here, we've got our probiotics, which of course are a brilliant supplement to take to just keep that good bacteria in your gut balanced. You, Metagenics also do do specialized um, probiotics for IBS. So and I'm sure other companies do as well. So that's again, a really good um, supplement to take on an ongoing basis if you really struggle to just really help your gut repair. Okay, so I've nearly finished, but look, just in summary, look, this is really what I'd hoped, you know, to share with you tonight, which is, how you can really manage your bloating and IBS when you're doing low carb by first removing some of these high FODMAP foods. You need to calm your gut down. And I've shown you which ones are the worst offenders. Um, when I'm working with clients, what I do is I go through a process where we'll eliminate one, one at a time. I normally start with the biggie, which is dairy. Um, get rid of that, manage symptoms, and then we can look at vegetables, and then we reintroduce. So I have a bit of a protocol that I go through with clients, which, is, which, which works really well. So we remove those foods because we want to calm the gut down. I also have even my put out the fire plan, which is basically a radical two day plan. When people have a real flare up, I have a two day emergency plan for want of a better word to just absolutely put out that fire of fermentation that works really well too. And then you wanna repair. So I've already shown you some of these supplements that you can use to just start really improving your gut, you know, your probiotic taking those supplements, your digestive enzymes so that your gut's just working better. And then it's the simple things too, getting enough sleep and really working on your stress management by bringing in some of these mindset things like breathing and journaling so that your stomach feels a bit calmer. That will really help. Then of course, we reintroduce these foods. Um, you know, the problem with FODMAP diet, and this is where it gets criticized, is that a lot of people just follow the FODMAP diet for a really long time. And that's actually not great for your gut either, because those foods that, are, you know, we've talked about cauliflower and onion are a really good source of prebiotics, which is the food that bacteria eat. They are good foods. So you don't want to think, you don't really want to cut them out forever, because then you're, you are quite limiting yourself in terms of having the most vibrant microbiome that you could hope for. So to me, the goal is to eliminate, calm the farm, get your gut feeling happier, and then introducing these foods back really slowly, working out a good portion size so that you can still have them as part of your nutrition because they are really super healthy and good to have. It's just finding out your limit of what you can tolerate. Then, of course, looking at how you eat so that you are going to be able to digest your food really well as you age. And this is where, you know, things like eating slowly, you know, waiting between meals and not drinking too much water, all of that stuff comes in. 
Right. So before I go for questions, I'm just going to quickly tell you about, look, if you would like to work with me, how I can help, hopefully, because this is the thing, you know, of course, you can do this on your own. And I absolutely encourage and I hope that with what I've helped you with tonight, that you'll be able to just take that and run with it. But look, if you do want help, I, of course, am a practitioner. I have my Why Weight Academy, which is about weight loss. But as I've said, I do bring in principles of IBS for people who need that help. So with my program, you get a lot of resources on a private web page, food plans, meal plans, so that you can look after your weight loss and get cracking. I also have plans where people can check in with me, which gives that accountability. And that is really, really key in weight loss and really anything to do with nutrition. It's so much easier to work through these challenges if you're not doing it alone. These are the resources that people get when they join my academy, which is obviously a lot of low carb food resources, as well as goal setting. I send out emails every week and recipes because it's really all about just keeping on working on the mindset so that we do what we know we want to and stay on track and achieve our goal, of course. So these are some of the online programs that I have as well. I have a lot of um, you know, food plans that you can download particularly if you want to lose weight. So they're all available as well. And these are the memberships. So if you would like to work with me on a one-on-one -on -one basis, the best option is the premium plan because then you get to see me for a one-hour one hour appointment where we can go over your food plan and, and bring in where you're at with your IBS. And then you come back every fortnight for check-ins. And that's particularly useful with managing your symptoms, but also if you want to lose weight. So you can incorporate both of those strategies um, when we work together. I've also got the basic plan, which is just for the resources and I've also got a VIP plan. VIP plan. That's for people who basically can't trust themselves to do it on do it on their own and have to come and see me every single week because some people need that extra level of support. And look, I've got a special offer just for people who have come along tonight or watched this presentation till the end of July. If you would like to work with me to help you on this, um, I can I'm I can I'm reducing that joining fee, which gives you that one hour appointment, and so that's ninety nine dollars, which saves you seventy six dollars. So that's just an option if you want to come and see me and get a plan to work with your IBS and also lose weight if that's your goal. So I'd love to offer you that tonight.